Good morning, everyone. It's good to welcome you uh, to our service this morning in Downshire Road. We're glad to see if you're visiting with us. We do extend a warm welcome to you. If you're watching online or listening on CD, uh, we thank you for doing so, and we trust you will know the Lord's blessing as we seek to know his blessing here in the meeting house. Let me make uh, some announcements uh, for us uh, this morning. Uh, our service is normal next Sunday morning at half past 11. And then this morning, um, you will receive on your way out a little leaflet, Nolan's Helping Hands Romania Christmas Appeal. And uh, these will be uh, available at the vestibule door as you leave uh, this morning. This is what we've known in the past as the shoebox appeal. Uh, so I do encourage you to take one away. And uh, the closing date for any donations is the 27th of October. And please note that all items that are donated must be new. Uh, must be new. So we commend that to you this morning. And uh, Georgina, you'll be at the door, won't you, with the leaflets and, some, and somebody else? Yep, good. Okay, so watch out for those as you leave. Um, PW uh, starts again this Tuesday evening uh, for all ladies in the congregation at half past seven. The guest speaker is Mrs. Jane Barber, uh, who is a daughter of the late Reverend Dr. McGachie, former minister of Mourn Presbyterian. And then also this week, our midweek Bible study meetings recommence on Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. in the Annex. Uh, there are some study books available, I think from Helen or Gillian or in the vestibule. And uh, so we do, commend, we do commend that to you. And Thursday evening uh, at 8 o'clock uh, in the Annex, continuing our studies in the Sermon on the Mount from uh, last, uh, last time. And we're good to see some new folk uh, coming along to our Bible study groups, and uh, both in the Wednesday morning and on the Thursday evening. Uh, so maybe some younger people on Thursday evening, maybe some more men on Thursday evening as well. Uh, there's no pressure to talk, there's no pressure to, uh, to pray, just to come along and enjoy uh, the Bible study. And if you prefer a daytime study, then you go along on Wednesday morning. Uh, and then just in relation to PW also, there's a PW link meeting on Monday the 14th of October at 7.30 p.m. in Sandy Street. And then there's an invitation from Ryan's PW uh, to our own PW to attend, to join with them on Thursday the 17th uh, of October at 8 o'clock, at which I will be uh, the guest uh, speaker. Our youth club is up and running, so do spread the word uh, that more young people will come along. And just something for 18 and over for young adults. Uh, on Saturday the 19th of October, there will be a young adults rally in Claddymore Presbyterian uh, Church Hall. And the guest speaker is Mr. Jeff Gaughan, the assistant minister in Rich Hill Presbyterian Church. That's for young adults age 18 and uh, over. Now, these uh, are the announcements. Uh, let us worship God. We read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and verse uh, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Let us join together as we sing to God's praise the words of hymn number 236 from Psalm 98. Sing to God new songs of worship.
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, almighty and eternal one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we sing with gladness the praises of your name. Sing with gladness for the marvelous things you have done. Sing with gladness for you are God, who alone is worthy of all praise and honor and blessing. You are God who alone is creator, redeemer, and judge. You are God who alone is the holy and righteous one. You are God who alone is merciful and compassionate, gracious and kind, slow to anger, and abounding in love. We come before you this day and praise you that we are able to draw near to you because of Jesus, because through him who is the Son of God, the way has been opened into your presence. Through him who is the promised King and Messiah, descendant of King David, crucified, dead and buried, but raised to life by your power. Our God, majestic and mighty one, we praise your name, for great is your name, and great is that salvation which is in you by your grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We bless your name because there is no other name but the name of Jesus by which any sinner is saved, made alive in him and brought into your family and your presence. O Lord our God, we praise you for the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. We praise you for his death on the cross to show us the nature of your love and to atone for sin. We praise you that with Jesus there is redemption from and forgiveness of our sin. Eternal God, unchanging and holy one, you reveal who you are and what you are like in your word. You call us to worship you in spirit and in truth. But we confess, our God, that we often worship you not as you have made yourself known, but who we wish you to be. We confess, O God, that at times we deny aspects of your name and nature to suit ourselves and the way we want to live our lives. We confess that we want you to bless what we do rather than seeking to do that which you bless. Our God, have mercy and forgive us our sin. Forgive us, our God, when our worship shapes you into what we want rather than shaping us into what you want. Have mercy in the name of Jesus. Cleanse us from our sin by his blood and grant us the assurance of sin forgiven. We pray, our God and Father, in Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit to move us from sin and to holiness, from disobedience and to obedience, from being shaped by the values of the world to being shaped by kingdom values. Our Lord and God, we bless you for this day and give you thanks that we can gather this day to worship you, to praise your name and to hear your truth. We pray for ears to hear all that you will say to us, and pray for your Spirit to renew and transform our lives. We thank you, Father, for your many and daily blessings on our lives. Were we to count them, we would discover all that you have done for us. We pray that we will understand that what we have is from you, and that you call us to use what we have for the glory of your name. We pray, Father, that in bringing before you our offering of gifts and tithes that we have given generously, because we delight to give to the work of advancing your kingdom, building your Son's church, and helping his people in need across the world. Bless what we have given to the glory of Jesus. And hear our prayer, for we ask these things in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, we turn to God's Word this morning. Can I invite you to open our Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. 
the longest psalm in the, in, the, in the collection of psalms. We're not going to read it all. You'll be glad to hear just reading some verses uh, from verse 97 to verse 105, and it's page 620 in our Pew Bibles. Psalm 119 from verse 97. Let us hear the Word of God. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Amen, and we thank God for this, his word. Boys and girls, good to see you this morning. If you want to come up to the front, and I'll come down to see you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are we all right? Yeah. Good to see you, boys and girls. You girls are outnumbered this morning. So you are. Can you cope? Maybe can you cope? Uh-huh. Uh, these two will give you a run for your money, you know. So they will. So listen, I've brought three things with me this morning, okay, to help us in our lesson today. I'm going to show you the three things, okay, and then I want you to try and figure out what links them, okay, what connects them. Do you understand? Yeah? Okay. So here's the first thing. You can tell me what this is. Yes? Honey. Honey. That's right. Honey. That's right. Do you boys have any honeys, do you? <laughs> yeah, the, the penny dropped over here eventually. So it did. So what would we use honey for? What, where would we? Put it on your toast or bagel. Put it on your toast or bagel. Is that nice, Arthur? Is it? Yes. yes. What, what do you think, Jordan? Um, I got bagels. You got bagels with honey as well, did you? Where else might you put honey? Yes. And tea. And tea, that's right, yes. Especially when you've got a sore throat. Yep, indeed. I like honey on bacon. On bacon, honey on bacon. Okay. Very good, yes. On oats, okay. Honey's lovely on carrots roasted in the oven. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, indeed. So there's lots of ways we would, we would use uh, honey. And I'm just going to put that down there for a second. So can anybody tell me what this might be? Can anybody tell me what this might be? Do you know, boys, do you? Yeah. What is it? Um, I can, no, nope. we'll be to open it up so I can show you. Anybody tell me what it is now? What's that? A compass, that's right. And, and what does a compass do? What is a compass? How does a compass help us? Yes. It shows you which direction is north, that's right. So you can find your way, isn't that right? It always points to north, yes. So where are we? So there's north that way, okay. And so sometimes when you want to find from point A to point B on a map, then you use a compass to help you do that. Yes, Jordan? What? Uh, like find the tenth letter? Yep. Okay, so that's a compass. And then the last thing I have here, anybody tell me what this is? Anybody tell me what this is? A whistle. A whistle. That's a wee torch, isn't it? Yeah, it's a wee torch. 
And what would we use the wee torch for? Yes, in the dark, that's right, yes. Or looking for that lost car under your bed, is that we, we, something like that as well, yes, Fraser? Under the couch. Looking for your lost car under the couch, okay, right. Yes, and a torch or a lamp is very handy to have if you have to get up in the middle of the night and you go and you turn it on so you don't fall over your shoes and your trainers and the big pile of laundry that you forgot to put into the basket. Isn't that right? So you can find your way in the dark. Now, tell me this, here's the question. What links all three together? What, what do they all have in common? How, what connects them? And if you're listening carefully to our Bible reading, a moment ago you would have got a wee clue. What do you think? What do you think? What, what, what do you think is the answer? Um, what are you two going to tell me? No, no. Right, okay, so in our Bible reading a moment ago, we read that honey, which is nice and sweet, honey is a sweet thing, but we are told that God's Word is sweeter than honey, so even nicer than honey is God's Word. And we were told that your Word is a, a lamp for our path, a light for our feet. Now, it didn't tell us anything about a compass, but a compass also helps us think about God's Word. Compass helps us to find our way. Compass teaches us the direction in life we need to go, and that is trusting and following Jesus in our lives. So, yeah, so these three simple little things teach us some important things about God's Word and the importance of us reading it so we know it's good for us, we know it can help us in the dark when we can't find our way, and it knows that it helps us the direction we need to go in our lives, trusting and following Jesus. Will you remember that? Yes. So next time you're having honey in your tea or on your oats or on your toast or on your bagels or on your bacon or on your carrots, remember Psalm 119. Your word is sweeter than honey. Will we pray together? Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for these simple little things that help us to learn and understand important things about your Word. And the importance then that we need to read it and understand it if we are to know its blessing in our lives and to know the direction we, you want our lives to go in, trusting and following Jesus, and to help us when we can't find our way. So we thank you for that today. And we thank you, Father, uh, that, and we pray that whether we're the youngest here or the oldest, we will all know the importance of your word for our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, you know, the most wonderful thing God says to us from his word is that Jesus loves us. And that's what we're going to sing about now, number 270. Jesus loves us, this I know. Loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
Now we read again uh, from God's Word this morning. We turn again to 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2 and verses 1 to 13, page 1195 in our Pew Bibles. 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verses 1 to 13. Let us hear the Word of God. And Paul wrote, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone complete, competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Amen. And we thank God for his word. As we come to our prayers of intercession, it is with regret that I announce the death of Mrs. Ethel Weir, 8 Orchard Villas, Nure. Ethel died in Craigavon Area Hospital on early Tuesday morning after a short illness. We extend our deepest sympathies to her daughters, Gail and Darrell, her grandchildren, Christopher, Emma, Joshua and Victoria at the family circle at this difficult and sad time. The funeral arrangements are private. Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we pray for those who grieve this day, remembering especially the family of the late Mrs. Ethel Weir. We pray, Father, that in the remembrance of her, her family will know your comfort and help at this difficult time. We pray for Gail and Darrell, for Christopher and Emma, Joshua and Victoria, and all in the family and friendship circle who knew Ethel and are sad at her death, who grieve her passing, and who are learning now to live with the memories of her life. We remember with much thankfulness her faithfulness to your church here in Downshire Road. Comfort those who grieve, O God, as your word uh, promises. O Lord our God, you are the sovereign of the world, the true king and ruler over all things. We trust the truth of your word in declaring your sovereignty. But lament, O God, at the problems and the crises we see in the world. And so we pray now for uh, matters in the world. O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. O God, the Holy One of Israel. We continue to pray for the ongoing conflicts in the Middle East and the escalating refugee crisis in Lebanon adding to the refugee crisis in Gaza. 
We pray, Father, for the violence to end, uh, for the weapons of war to be set to one side, for peace to come, for humility and contrition, and the willingness for Jew and Arab to live side by side, respecting each other's aspirations without trampling on each other's dignity and rights. We pray, Father, that there will not be further escalation of conflict in the Middle East, that Israel and Iran will not increase tension by increasing direct combat with one another. And we pray, Father, for courageous and humble and generous leadership to end these conflicts, to restore peace, to return hostages, to renew hope, to bring relief to the many in great need across that region. And we pray for gospel hope to replace fear and mistrust and distress. And we pray, Father, that you will visit that region in power, bringing your salvation in Jesus Christ. Our God and Father, in whose image we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we lament the reality of abortion in our society, the attitude of wanting to get rid of, terminate the life of, abort the unborn child. We lament our God the cries of the unborn who do not see the light of day, who are not given the chance to live, to know and to be known. We lament this evil in our society and pray, our God and Father, that you will have mercy on this land, this land in which many, too many, celebrate this culture of death the death of the unborn. And we thank you, Father, and pray for those pro-life organizations, for the Society for the Prevention of the Unborn Child, for Precious Lives, for Both Lives Matters, and, and other Christian organizations that advocate for the unborn. We pray, Father, that their voice has been heard, not just by those who agree with them, but especially by the many politicians in our land that disregard the sanctity of life as created in your image. We pray for your mercy upon this land, this nation, that you will visit this land in power, O God, that many will turn from this evil to confess Jesus Christ, the author of life, as their Savior and King. We pray that many, won't, many will turn from this culture of death to embrace and hold to the sanctity of life, including and most especially the life of the unborn. For we know what is ahead of us, Father. We know that the discussions about euthanasia or assisted suicide are, are moving at a pace. And we pray, O oh God, that you will hamper and hinder the efforts of those who push that agenda also. And we pray, Father, for those who have terminated a pregnancy and regret their decision. We pray for your comfort and mercy to such in their distress. Grant them your grace. Grant them the, the help and the support that they need. Grant them the hope that comes in knowing Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Our God and Father, hear these our prayers, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, before we come to look at God's Word this morning, we want to sing Again, to his praise, they're the wonderful words of hymn number 448, a hymn that places our focus uh, squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ triumphant, ever reigning. <laughs>
I meant to say earlier, it's great to see such a, a good number out at Sunday service uh, this morning, and that when the boys and girls and the Sunday school teachers leave, it's still great to see such a good number uh, in the meeting house, and despite the inclement weather uh, today, it's just lovely to see. It was the same in Ryan's as well uh, this morning. I thought my voice was better than it was, so forgive me if, uh, if uh, I struggle a little bit. I have to preach again this evening at a harvest in uh, Rathfryland. So, but I wonder, do you have stickability? Or might you be described as a dog with a bone? Now, that may sound insulting, but we know what it means. Perseverance, a dogged determination to stick at something to get the task done. In a rather humorous little book that I have at home, I know I've said this, shared this before, but for those of you who haven't heard it, uh, I have a little, this little book at home called The 77 Habits of Highly Ineffective Christians. Habit number 77 is don't finish what you start. The author states that growing Christians learn that it is vital to complete tasks God has given them. But the ineffective Christian discovers how good it is to begin many things and finish just a few. The most important thing, the author says, is that the Apostle Paul would be aghast at such thinking. He would be aghast at not finishing what you start. The joke is that the author didn't finish what he was going to finish. Um, Paul wrote uh, later in this letter, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Paul is saying that he knows his life is near the end, but he has stuck to the task God has given him. And he used two images in that later verse that he uses in the passage before us today, a race and a fight. The Apostle Paul demonstrated stickability, a dogged determination to keep going to the very end to stay the course, to live for Christ till his dying breath, to keep the pattern of sound teaching, to guard the good deposit until his life's journey was over. And that's the challenge Paul wants to impart to Timothy. And it's the challenge God imparts to all of us who read this portion of his truth and are serious about being a disciple of Jesus. Paul has, has charged Timothy to keep the pattern of sound teaching, to guard the good deposit of the gospel that has been entrusted to him. And this is not a one-off exercise. This is not like the little girl who, who, after her first day at P1, went home and told her, Mommy, that's it, Mommy, I've, I've been to school, I've done it, I've finished, it was great. And Mommy says, No, you've got to go for another 13 or 14 years. This challenge of, of keeping the pattern of sound teaching, of, of guarding the good deposit of the gospel, is not just a, a once-time exercise. It's a call and a challenge for every day till our dying breath. And Paul, in this passage before us, explains how, how we can do this, what's at the heart of doing this. We read in verse 1, Paul wrote, "'You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, the task of keeping the pattern of sound teaching, the task of guarding the gospel, is a spiritual task. It's a kingdom of God task, and therefore it requires a strength from above. It requires spiritual strength, because we have enemies that want to undermine and destroy the gospel, that want to undermine the Word of God and the truth of God's Word. And so, in keeping this pattern of sound teaching and guarding the good deposit of the gospel, we find strength not in ourselves to do this, but by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So, how are we strengthened in the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus? Well, I think it's very simple. We do not neglect the means of grace. We do not neglect the means by which the Lord has given us to bless us and to strengthen us for the work He has called us to do. Reading our Bibles, prayer, 
regular attendance at public worship and regular participation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, regular fellowship with, with God's people. These are the means by which we are strengthened in the Lord. But Paul says there's another aspect to keeping the pattern of, of sound teaching and guarding the good deposit, which we, which we then read in verse, about in verse 2. Paul wrote, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, Paul here is primarily talking about teaching ministry in the church, and we keep the pattern of sound teaching, and we guard the gospel by, by entrusting it to others who are also qualified to teach, so it doesn't just fall on the shoulders of one or two people. More broadly speaking, God's Word, especially Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 78, is clear on the responsibility of entrusting this pattern of sound teaching, this good deposit of the gospel to others, including and most especially the next generation. We have already seen this in the life of Timothy, what he received from his grandmother and his mother, what he received from the apostle Paul. He is now charged to entrust to others. How do we keep the good message of the gospel going? We, we share it, we entrust it to others. And so our duty to keep this pattern of sound teaching that comes to us in the Word of God and to guard the good deposit of the gospel involves teaching and training God's people and our children so that they can then do likewise. But this task of, of holding on to biblical truth, of guarding the gospel, is not a walk in the park. Paul turns to three images to help Timothy to help us understand this challenge in the Christian life. The image of a soldier, the image of an athlete, and the image of a farmer. And all three images uh, are, all, all suggest common attributes in the Christian life. All suggest discipline uh, and dedication, uh, enduring hardship, being focused, all images, all three images suggest self-denial, avoiding the distractions of this world, avoiding taking it easy for the sake of the calling to be a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. All three speak against what, what we might say laid-back religion, easy chair religion, which is not Christianity. And if we are to hold to the teaching of God's Word, if we are to guard the gospel that has been entrusted to us, then we have to be willing to endure hardship and experience opposition like a soldier because the Christian life is lived in the context of warfare. We have enemies, and therefore we will want and we ought to want to listen for and obey the commandments of the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And if we are to guard uh, the pattern of sound teaching, guard, <laughs> excuse me, the good deposit, then we also need to realize that we are not only in a war, but also in a race. We're not competing against each other, but through discipline, we are seeking to lay aside every hindrance in our walk with the Lord, live according to the rules and our obedience to the Lord as we run that race to the very end, to the finish line. We cannot expect to run the Christian life well, to hold to the, to the truth of God's Word, to guard the gospel if we are not concerned to live a holy life. For we'll only receive the victor's crown if we have run the race well, run the race according to the way God wants us to run it, and have run it till the end. And if we are to keep the pattern of sound teaching and guard the good deposit entrusted to, it, to us, it also requires us to be hardworking like a farmer. Hard work is indispensable to good farming, as it is to maintaining the truth and the gospel. For the farmer cannot let his or her guard down in the work of plowing and sowing and reaping, of tending the herds and the flocks, and of simply just looking after the farm and all the fixtures and fittings. 
And that's why Paul writes that the farmer deserves the first share of the crops for his or her, his or her hard work. But the point Paul is making is that there's no room for laziness in the Christian life. If we are to, to keep the pattern of sound teaching, hold the, the, to the truth of God's Word and guard the gospel, then like the farmer, we need to be diligent in attending to, to the different aspects of our life, our mind, our heart, our words, and our deeds. If sin is everything we do uh, by our thoughts, our words, and our deeds that is contrary to the Word of God, then holiness is everything we do in our thoughts, our words, and deeds that is compliant to the Word of God. And Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that requires effort. Guarding our hearts and minds against error, against false teaching, holding to the sound teaching of God's Word, Holding to the, to the gospel requires effort. And if we don't commit ourselves to the hard work of keeping the pattern of sound teaching and guarding the good deposit of the gospel, then the enemy will find ways to distract us, will find it easy to distract us, to lead us astray. The enemy will find a fertile ground to sow his seeds of doubt and despair because we're letting our guard down. The enemy will find it easy to trip us up and to neglect the hard work of growing in our knowledge of the Lord, of growing in our strength and hope in the gospel. And again, it comes back to not neglecting what the Lord has given us, those means of grace to strengthen us in the hope of the gospel and the truth of His Word, to help us stand firm in the ways of the Lord. And so we need to ask ourselves regularly, am I committed to keeping the pattern of sound teaching, to guarding the gospel that's been entrusted to me? We need to ask ourselves, am I serving as a good soldier for Christ, running a good race for Christ, working as a good farmer for Christ? And if you're a child of God, you're a child of God only by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're a child of God, then praise the Lord. But are you still in the nursery? Are you still sucking your spiritual thumb? You're still wanting everything to be fed to you. You need to grow up in the things of the Lord. Uh, maybe, maybe you are a young adult in, in the Christian faith. Maybe you've left the nursery behind you some years ago, and you're a young adult in, in the Christian life. Praise God, there's been growth in your life. There's been spiritual maturity and growth in your life. But you know what the Lord wants you to be? He wants you to be a spiritual father and mother to those who are younger than you in the faith. He doesn't want to see stunted growth in His children. When I was in school, you know, the, some of the lads used to go around behind the gym to smoke, you know. I wasn't one of them. It used to be that smoking will stunt your growth. That was the thing. That was what, what you, you, you were warned of, to not take up the habit. But many Christians are stunted in their growth because they're not putting the hard yards into growing up in Christ to become a spiritual father or mother to those who are younger in the faith. And we cannot expect the gospel to be preserved. We cannot expect Christian values and the truth of God's Word to be preserved in our lives and in our society if we're still in the spiritual nursery, still sucking our thumbs on, on, on our spiritual thumbs. If we're not rising to the call and the challenge that God lays before us in His Word. And Paul says that if we, if we take time to reflect on these things, we will discover that this is what the Christian life is all about. He says, take time, think on these things deeply, and the Lord will affirm what I've been saying. You know, biblically speaking, we live in a very superficial age. We live by scriptural sound bites. We live by Twitter Twitter Christianity, little morsels of Christianity, and we think that's enough 
to keep us going. We build our lives on a verse here and a verse there. We take verses out of their biblical context and turn them into personal mantras. We go and get chicken nuggets and think that's what will satisfy us. But the Lord wants us to be, to be eating biblically juicy steaks. He wants us to feed well on His Word that we know are are no longer in the spiritual nursery, but are growing up into Him who is our head. And so Paul says that we need to consider God's Word more fully and more deeply, more deeply and more broadly, if we are to better understand what this Christian life is all about. But this Christian life is not a walk in the park, for it involves enduring hardship, facing enemies, being disciplined, being focused, and, and hard working. If we are to live more faithfully, more effectively for Jesus. And then Paul adds in the passage that if we are to, to do this, then there's something essential we are to remember. Well, did you notice it in verse 8? Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. We are to remember Jesus Christ because, as the late John Stott once wrote, Jesus Christ is the proper object of our worship, our witness, and our hope. And the command to remember Jesus Christ calls for the remembrance of two things. We remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For in remembering the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we are seeing the demonstration of God's power. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead raises the sinner from their spiritual death to life in Jesus. And the resurrection of Jesus means the, the power for our bodily resurrection when Jesus returns in His glory. And so the resurrection of Jesus from the dead should engender a perpetual Easter season, Easter joy in the lives of His children. But we remember also that Jesus was descended from King David. Jesus was the promised king who would reign on the throne of David forever. And the title Christ means Messiah, God's Savior, God, the one whom God sent to bring in his kingdom. And so memory of Jesus' Messiahship invites us to see Jesus as the culmination of God's salvation plan, that we would bow before him as our king. And it's amazing when we think of just one verse can captures the whole of Jesus' life. For this remembrance of Jesus includes his incarnation, his obedience, his suffering, his death, for there's no resurrection from the dead if there's no death on the cross. And this remembrance of Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David, also speaks to us of his humanity and his divinity. And so we remember Jesus Christ as we were singing a few moments ago. What a great hymn that is about Jesus Christ. But also in remembering Jesus Christ, we remember the pattern for the Christian life. For no servant is above the master. And the pattern of that is the pattern of suffering leading to glory, of death giving way to life, of no cross, no glory. And so at the heart of, of keeping this pattern of sound teaching, of guarding the good deposit of the gospel, we remember Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is central. Paul states that this is his gospel for which he is suffering, the gospel which he gives his life, that the elect may obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. There is no gospel if there's no Jesus Christ. There's no adoption, no redemption, no forgiveness, no assurance, no resurrection to eternal life, no glory, if there is no Jesus Christ. And so do you know this Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Do you bow before Him as your King? And Paul concludes in this section with, with a trustworthy saying. He does this in his letters from time to time. And part of this trustworthy saying reflects something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. 
Well, the first part of this trustworthy saying is a, is a simple Christian principle. If we died with Christ, we will, we will live with Christ. If we endure for Christ, we will reign with Christ. And what Paul is saying, that is, if our identity and life are bound up in this Jesus Christ, then we will live with this Jesus Christ forever. And that's the only way we can know eternal life, is having our whole identity bound up with this Jesus Christ that, that Paul so eloquently spoke of in just one sentence. But on the other hand, states Paul, reflecting the teaching of Jesus and the gospel, if we disown him, he will disown us. For Jesus taught that whoever acknowledges him before, uh, before others, he will acknowledge them before the Father. But whoever disowns him before others, he will disown them before the Father in heaven. And this represents apostasy. This represents a complete turning away from Jesus. This represents a settled denial of him as Savior, Lord, and King. And believe it or not, religious people can, can hold to this. And furthermore, if we are faithless, Jesus remains faithful to his warnings. So he will disown those who are faithless to him rather than denying himself. And so we delude ourselves into thinking we can go to heaven, that we can be with God forever, that somehow everything will work out just fine in the end, but at the same time deny Jesus. Jesus risen from the dead. Jesus descended from heaven. Jesus fully God and fully human. And, then, and if we deny Jesus, if we deny this Jesus Christ, we deny the power of the gospel as the only way to save sinners and to bring them to the Father. Are you denying Jesus today? Are you saying, oh yes, I want to be in heaven, but I don't want all that Jesus stuff? Don't work like that. I don't work like that. And so in the call and challenge to keep the pattern of, of sound teaching and to guard the good deposit of the gospel, to, to hold to the truth of God's word, we stick at it as we look to the grace of Jesus Christ to help us as we entrust his teaching to others, as we accept the reality of, of hardship and enemies and discipline and endurance and hard work, as we remember Jesus raised from the dead, descended from David, Jesus who is the gospel, and acknowledge him before others. Let us pray. We bless you, our God, for the reading and proclamation of your truth for our lives this day. We thank you, our God, that your word helps us to understand better what is involved in keeping this pattern of sound teaching and guarding the good deposit that has been entrusted to us. We pray, Father, that we will see and understand that all who are in Jesus Christ have this responsibility to keep this pattern of sound teaching, to guard the good deposit of the gospel. We pray, Father, that we will take seriously this call, this challenge, but do so with realism that we are in a war for the truth of your word, that we are running a race, and that we are called to hard work. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will help us stay the course, to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our gaze on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame and sat down at your right hand. We pray, our God, that by your Spirit you will help us to understand that the battle for your truth does not end till we are in glory or Christ has returned. And Father, we pray for any here this day who are not in the battle for your truth, who are not running for Jesus, who are not engaged in the hard work of caring for your truth, that they will see what is at stake and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, 
you will raise them from their spiritual death and bring them to life in Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Our closing praise this morning is hymn number 557. Hymn number 557, Fight the Good Fight with All Your Might. forth to seek and to serve and to follow Christ. The blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day until Christ calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen.